The night before, Bani had showed Harriet a glossy reproduction of a Chagall painting, the one in which a startled woman is being kissed by a floating, sinuous lover, a dream transmuted into colors so audacious you couldn't help smiling, as if in recognition. And when Bani said with her new skepticism, nobody can do this, can they? Harriet said, oh, people can do it, some, anything sometimes. The answer was meant to be fanciful. Bonnie was of an age now, eight, nearly nine, when the most subtle intonations and nuances in adult voices registered with her like music. Harriet sometimes wondered if she and her husband were training their daughter in the ambiguities of life and not its stark primary colorations. That day, a day in late spring, had been unusually warm, but by evening the temperature had dropped 20 degrees. A sudden fierce wind was blowing up, so Harriet went about closing windows. She was straining to close a window in the, in the rear room, a, a place that's a room mostly glass her husband used as a study at, at home. When she saw a movement, the fleet after image of a movement somewhere behind her reflected in the glass, and she knew. She knew the height of the figure, its peculiar swiftness, meant it wasn't Bonnie, and of course it wasn't her husband, who was away at an academic conference. She knew, she knew, yet she continued tugging at the window even as her heart beat rapidly, and a wave of terror washed over her. She thought, I can get out the back door, I can run for help, but she knew she'd never leave Bonnie behind. Bonnie was upstairs in her room. She had left the door unlocked, the door leading to the garage. She knew at once that was it. Everyone in the neighborhood kept doors unlocked during the day. Children were always trailing in and out of houses. Why had hers been singled out? She could have wept for the mistake she'd made. She could not now undo. She saw by the digital clock on her husband's desk it was 7.40. She thought, I must remember that time. She was behaving still as if nothing were wrong dreamy and shivering, walking a little slower and more stiffly than usual. Even as she re-entered the house knowing how the air was disturbed by their presence and smelling them, something acrid and sweaty and excited, sensing their very weight on the floorboards, she was consciously behaving as if nothing were wrong. As if observing her, taking pity on her, they might yet relent and go away. She found herself staring at the dining room clock, but this time the hour didn't register. Someone said loudly, Lady! And she turned to see two youngish men advancing toward her, two strangers, both in jeans and T-shirts, one of them with a flattened nose and oddly appealing eyes, the other rangy, weedy, with long, lank, faded red hair, jutting ears, a light dusting of freckles on his face. He was the one carrying the knife. They were high and nerved up, staring at her and grinning, both talking at once. We're not going to hurt you, lady. Just stay cool. Stay cool. She would think afterward that they spoke like hoodlums on television or in the movies, for how otherwise would they speak? Got some cash in here? Find us some cash, lady. Where's your purse, lady? Come on, lady. Nobody's going to get hurt. Get your ass moving and nobody's going to get hurt. Her heartbeat was so hard and rapid she thought she was going to faint, and afterward she would realize with a stab of angry regret that had she fainted at that moment, just fallen, limp and helpless to the floor, they would probably have fled the house grabbed a few things, whatever was handy, and fled. But no, she made an effort to keep from fainting, as if out of courtesy. And it was pride, too, for she thought of herself as a woman who took control of situations, a woman who was mature and responsible, not hysterical, a woman with a steady, level gaze whom you could trust. That was what she wanted the men to think, wasn't it, that they could trust her? For wasn't she cooperative? Wasn't she calm? and even in a way gracious, leading them into the kitchen where she'd left her purse, except it wasn't there, where was it? And speaking quietly to them, saying, you don't want to do this, really, my husband will be home in a few minutes, he'll be back before eight o'clock, saying, that knife makes me nervous, why don't you put it down, it isn't necessary, really, not quite pleading. My daughter is upstairs, she's only eight years old, please don't frighten her, please go away before you frighten her. But where was her purse? Why couldn't she find her purse? Her teeth had begun to chatter, and her hands and knees were shaking uncontrollably. They were her age, perhaps a year or two younger, mature men in their early 30s, but loud and loudish and deliberately clumsy. It almost seemed like teenagers, scared of what they were doing, but exhilarated too, showing off Harriet saw for each other's benefit. 
seeing, and seeing that she was an attractive woman, a small bone, terrified woman, no match for them, perhaps for her benefit as well. They gave her orders in high, breathless voices, telling her to get some cash and where's the silverware, and nobody's going to get hurt if she did what they said. Move your ass, lady. Come on, lady. The man with the knife said repeatedly in a boy's sniggering tone as if Harriet were a dumb creature in need of prodding. So naturally, Bonnie heard them and started downstairs, and Harriet, her hand shaking even more violently, pulling open a drawer to show the men her silverware, what remained of an elegant sterling set belonging to her grandmother, rarely used and badly tarnished, thought she would never hear anything again in her life so wrenching, so unspeakably terrible, as her daughter's running footsteps on the stairs and her daughter's lifted voice, inquisitive rather than alarmed, Mommy? Mommy? Don't come in here, honey, Harriet called out. Bonnie, go back upstairs, please. Keeping her voice level and taking pride in the fact, yes, her voice is level, Mommy is calm. Bonnie will remember when it's over. For she was thinking even then, even as Bonnie ran into the kitchen, that this wasn't happening to her alone, this was happening to Bonnie as well, and she must behave in a way that reflected that fact. And she was thinking that the men would be yet more impressed. How could they not be impressed? A woman behaved so rationally, so cooperative, you might even say so sweetly under these emergency circumstances. Surely they, would f surely they would feel admiration for her and sympathy. Surely they would go qu away quickly with whatever she could give them and would not injure her or her daughter. Wouldn't they? Harriet saw that the men were nearly as frightened of Bonnie as Bonnie was frightened of them. They were so high, so stoned, they hadn't seemed to have counted on a child. She said calmly, let her go up to her room, please. She didn't want to beg or plead. She hoped simply to sound reasonable. She's just a little girl. Let her go up to her room, please, as Bonnie, whimpering and sobbing, hid behind her, clutching at her legs. The child was small bone like her mother, with her mother's pale, silvery blonde hair and wide-spaced brown eyes. Her cheeks were babyish plump and streaked now with tears. How quickly, Harriet thought, children cry, as if the tears are always there in readiness. Let her go upstairs, please, Harriet told the men with as much an air of authority as she could simulate. Don't frighten her like this. Have some compassion. The man with the flattened nose seemed confused by her words and shrugged, okay. But the one with the knife said, hell no, lady. His mouth stretching like a rubber band and a fond, leering smile as if he knew Harriet intended to trick him and he was too smart for her. When he smiled, his cheeks dimpled. She'd call the police or something. You think we're assholes? She don't need to go anywhere. They were examining the silverware, and they were going to dump it in the grocery bag they'd found in one of the cupboards, but the man with the flattened nose said nervously he didn't think it looked like anything much. And the man with the knife, the lanky, red-haired, grinning man, said in derision, that's tarnish, asshole. That's, so, that's, how, that's, how much you, that's how you know it's the real thing. Harriet said desperately, please take it. It's, it's good silver, really. It's worth money. Okay, lady, and where's your purse? The man with the knife said. Where's your purse you said was out here? I th think it must be in the bedroom. You said it was out here, lady. I don't know where it is. I, I don't think there's much money in it. Shut up. Find it. Come on, get a move on. My husband will be home in a few minutes. He, fuck my husband. Who do you think you're jiving? Get a move on. He was furious suddenly, shouting in her face. Bonnie began screaming, Mommy, Mommy. She was pawing at Harriet as if she were crazed, and Harry had all she could do to subdue her, pinion her arms and clutch her tight. She could feel her daughter's heart beating wildly inside her small rib cage. How fragile, she thought, how easily smashed. Bonnie, she said, Bonnie, it's all right, all right, really, saying the same words over and over again, like an incantation. To the men, she said, let me put her in the bathroom, at least. There's a bathroom downstairs. Let me get her out of the way, please. She was pleading now, her voice rising. My daughter can't help you. She has nothing to do with this, please. The man with the knife was still suspicious, but his friend said, yeah, okay, good idea. And that seemed to be it. Bonnie was making them both very nervous. Harriet half carried her daughter to the bathroom in the hall, whispering to her to be a good girl, to be quiet. We're all over in a few minutes. Please, please be quiet. Could she promise? Lock the door and don't un unlock it until Mammy tells her to. What if the kid climbs out the window, the man with the knife said. His friend said, she ain't going to climb out the window. It's too high. Get cool. 